Welcome to Legal Issues and Recreation Administration. I'm Professor Kozlowski. I'll be your instructor during the, this particular lecture. Today we'll be looking at the May 2010 Law Review column, uh, which I wrote for the Parks and Recreation Magazine, which is the official publication of the National Recreation and Park Association. I've been writing this monthly column since January of 1982 to the present. And there's an online archive of these columns. Uh, most of them are posted from January of 82 to the present. And you have the link listed there. Uh, so you can take a look at the wide range of legal issues that have been covered in this column. Uh, since 1982. Today, as I said, we'll be looking at the May 2010 uh, article entitled Unpaid Student Interns Under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this particular article was prompted by a piece that appeared in the New York Times uh, April 2nd of 2010 uh, by Stephen Greenhouse entitled The Unpaid Intern, Legal or Not. This particular article mentioned that many employers failed to pay even though their internships did not comply with the six federal legal criteria that must be satisfied for internships to be unpaid. And we'll be taking a close look at those six federal legal criteria in this particular presentation. One point bears mentioning that upon written request to the Wage and Hour Division of the U.S. Department of Labor, which is authorized to enforce the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, you can ask and they will issue under certain circumstances legal opinion letters to provide guidance in this area, as long as the inquiry and request uh, is not prompted by any pending litigation uh, or an investigation by the Wage and Hour Division of the Department of Labor. Now in these, quote, opinion letters, uh, the Department of Labor responds to an inquiry uh, give an application of the law to particular facts presented in the question. And these opinion letters are viewed to constitute an agency ruling under the Code of Federal Regulations. That is, it will be looked upon as uh, an event, unlikely event of any court action, uh, an authoritative agency interpretation uh, made by the agency, in this case the Department of Labor, as a consequence of individual requests for rulings upon particular questions. And if you're complying with an opinion letter, uh, the presumption would be that you are in compliance with the particular law administered by that agency, in this case the Fair Labor Standards Act by the Department of Labor, the Wage and Hour Division. Let's look at one of these Department of Labor intern letter opinions uh, that was posted to the, the web by Department of Labor. <clears throat> In this particular opinion letter requested opinion concerning application of the Fair Labor Standards Act to college students who were participating in a client's internship program. In this particular internship uh, was described as purpose was to teach marketing, promotion, and statistical <clears throat> analysis to students in a real-world setting, typical of the practical experience that's to be gained in many uh, academic programs uh, through internships and practicum experience. Now, the most important case governing this area and discussed in the opinion letter and which would be applied by the Department of Labor 
in interpreting the Fair Labor Standards Act and the source of those six criteria mentioned earlier in the New York Times article is an old case from 1947 U.S. Supreme Court Walling versus Portland Terminal Company. In that particular case, the U.S. Supreme Court identified the six criteria that are used to determine whether the Fair Labor Standards Act would allow a trainee or student uh, to work without compensation. So let's take a look at the list of those six criteria. First is training. So even though it may include op actual operation of the facilities of an employer, and generally internships would take place on the uh, site of the sponsor or the employer, uh, the atmosphere, the approach is one which is to be similar to that given in, given in a vocational school. Practical training, uh, but as we'll see with more of a academic objective as opposed to just free labor for the employer or sponsoring organization. So the training is to be for the benefit of the trainee more so than the employer agency. And in so doing trainees, interns are not to displace regular employees free labor that puts other people out of work effectively. And they are to work under close supervision. In the context of a vocational school, this idea is it's school related that it be a sort of teacher-student relationship rather than just somebody uh, working a job. Furthermore, the employer fourth criteria provided training derives no immediate advantage from the activities of the trainees and on occasion the employer's operations may actually be impeded actually slows things down when you have to take time to instruct or oversee or supervise a particular intern as opposed to the employees that you're paying to do similar work, but the object of their work is to produce for you as opposed to the benefit practical experience to be gained by the trainee in an internship. The fifth of the five criteria is trainees are not necessarily entitled to a job upon completion of the training period, although indeed they may as is the case, uh, you do well at an internship, you increase your prospects of being hired, but there's no quid pro quo, no guarantee that you'll get a position. Again, it's not, it's not a two-way street. The internship is to be for the benefit of the trainee as opposed to equal benefit accruing to the employer. In the six criteria, employer and trainees understand that the trainees are not entitled to wages for time spent in training. That the training is for their benefit, usually as we'll see, to fulfill a field work or practical experience requirement of their academic program. Now, the Department of Labor's position is that generally it would not assert an employer-employee relationships which would exist for purposes of the Fair Labor Standards Act requiring wages for student interns. The presumption is that they would be unpaid interns, internships, assuming that those six criteria are met. And particularly in this context where certain work activities that are performed by the students rather than them doing a job filled by regular employees in 
in the context of it to be like a vocational school, it's simply an extension of their academic programs. So provided, once again, the key point, if it's unpaid, does it meet the six criteria we just described, enunciated by the Supreme Court in the Walling decision from 1947? So the objective of an unpaid internship, it should be designed to provide students with professional experience in furtherance of their education for their benefit, not so much for the employer. And in fact, as we've seen, it may indeed impede the employer's operation while they're helping these people gain such practical experience in training. So within the context of a vocational school, mentioned now the Walling case, the training must be academically oriented for the benefit of the students primarily, not free labor for the employer. Now these particular marketing students, interns, in the Department of Labor opinion letter that we're looking at, uh, Department of Labor said it was not clear that each of the six criteria were satisfied. The question being, is the practical experience the internship providing an educational experience that could not be obtained in the classroom. And it is an extension of that academic program. In other words, generally related to their course of study. Focuses on the intern, the student. The internship in yours to the benefit of the students. Helps them satisfy programs requirements that they receive college credit for performing an internship. It's not just an outside job. If so, then they should be paid for it. This particular opinion letter they found these marketing students did not appear likely that the marketing student in turn displaced regular employees. But in the inquiry, opinion request DOL noted, did not describe how closely the students are supervised. Again, in a vocational school context, it should appear as a teacher-student relationship. And it was not, there weren't enough facts to indicate whether or not any of the company's operations were impeded by virtue of the internship program. Generally, in your operation, you take on interns there's uh, quite a bit of necessary hand-holding to get them up to speed. Uh, and it does slow the day-to-day -day operations down. And usually by the time they are up to speed, uh, that's the end of the internship. Furthermore, the Department of Labor's noted in this situation with the marketing student, it was unclear whether the employer may derive immediate benefit in the activities of the student. If it's free labor, displaces regular employees, then they sh violates Fair Labor Standards Act. They should be paid for such work that's employer oriented as opposed to student academic oriented wherein it may indeed be unpaid. And furthermore, noted that the internship program does not appear to meet the fifth and sixth criteria. That is a guaranteed employment at the end of the internship and whether there's an understanding that or not regarding payment. The understanding should be they're not to be paid. So here it was unclear whether student interns, that fifth criteria, are not necessarily entitled to a job with the company at the end of their internship. And further, that sixth factor, uh, the understanding being the requirement 
that they are not to be compensated during the internship period. Now, in these particular set of facts presented by the inquiry, as a result, the Department of Labor concluded it could not determine definitely whether an employment relationship existed under the Fair Labor Standards Act between this particular company and the marketing student interns. So that's an example of an opinion letter put out by the Department of Labor. Let's look at a particular case example, fairly recent case, once again applying these factors in a situation involving unpaid on-the-job training. This involves the case of Carter versus Mayor and City Council of Baltimore City. It's a federal district court case in the District of Maryland and the opinion was published March 2nd, 2010. The facts of the case, current and former apprentices in the Baltimore City Fire Department were in a three-year firefighter paramedic apprentice program. And as part of the program, they were required to attend class and perform on-the-job practical training on an ambulance and in the hospital without compensation. And they alleged that this was in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act, that they indeed should have been paid. Now, state regulations in Maryland governing the content of advanced life support education programs, in fact, required these advanced life support students to complete a supervised clinical experience. And this was to include practice of skills within clinical education facilities. And then a supervised field internship had to include the practice of skills while functioning in a pre-hospital advanced life support environment. Now these particular apprentices brought the case, their training, they worked an eight-day cycle, four days on and four days off. And they were not compensated during their off-duty training times, where they were gaining that experience that was required by state regulations. So question being, would it satisfy the six criteria set out by the U.S. Supreme Court in Wallen? They contended they should have been compensated for this off-duty training time during the Fair uh, under the Fair Labor Standards Act. In fact, City of Baltimore, they alleged, were in violation of the act for not paying them. The Fair Labor Standards Act, assuming the internship exemption would not apply, requires covered employers pay employees not less than one and a half times their regular pay rate for all overtime hours worked. And there's a cite to the Fair Labor Standards Act there from Title 29 of the United States Code at Section 207A1. That's where that comes from. Here the apprentices alleged the city violated this provision once again by refusing them to pay them overtime, time and a half for that training time, for those hours spent in training outside their regular work week. How did the Maryland Federal District Court address the issue? Once again, they would apply the six criteria enunciated in Wiling versus Portland Terminal Company by U.S. Supreme Court uh, in that 1947 decision. So whether these trainees were to be considered employees thus protected by the Fair Labor Standards Act, which would require time and a half for that training time, but this requirement for time and a half pay, as the court noted, could not be interpreted so as to make a person whose work serves only his own interest, here the interest of the apprentices in 
putting in the necessary time required by state regulations in order to get licensed. It serves their interests and the employee here in the city of Baltimore of another person who gives them aid and instruction. So if that's the case, then it would be an exemption under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the six criteria wowing where indeed it could be unpaid. So looking at the criteria again, the issue is whether the employee here, the firefighter apprentices, or the employer city, who's the primary beneficiary of the trainee's labor. And here, looking at the applying the wowing decision, the reasoning therein, Federal District Court held the firefighter trainees were not employees because they obtained training comparable to a vocational school. You'll recall the reference to, is it analogous to a vocational school setting where it's practical setting on-site facility, but it certainly is part of a job-related academic program. And who benefits, the employer or the interns? Here, court found the city was not immediately benefited by the trainees activities. That indeed the trainees activities were supervised. Furthermore, in this idea of displacing regular employees, the trainees did not assume the duties of career firefighters. And any, any benefit to the city from the plaintiff supervised training activities was de minimis, i.e. inconsequential, insignificant. Primary benefit were for those trainees interns to require to satisfy state regulations. That the required classroom training that they're claiming they should be paid for was outside of regular working hours and it was neither integral or indispensable to their principal activity as fi firefighters who are now training to gain certification under advanced life support system. So their regular 40-hour work week was primarily as firefighter paramedic and the additional time is additional training for the advanced life support requirements under state regulations. So the court concluded that therefore the city should not be made liable for overtime pay for time its employees spend as students rather than workers. So indeed, unpaid student interns, if they're actual workers, then payment may be due under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the court had therefore held the hours spent in training were not compensable as hours worked under the Fair Labor Standards Act. In fact, all their classroom and practical training that they're claiming they should be paid for was required to obtain the certified I believe it's rescue technician license they were pursuing. That the CRT license was required in order for plaintiffs to conduct their duties as firefighters, paramedics. That this additional training the advanced life support systems, the plaintiffs were the primary beneficiaries of that training. That indeed, although they may have been firefighters, they were not certified or able to perform advanced life support system duties until they obtained their license, and to do so, they had to fulfill the 
legal requirement of the state regulations regarding hours of practical experience effectively on the job. Once again, the court noted that as a result, the training that was being gained was not integral and dispensable part of their paid work duties during the period of their training. So they distinguished between advanced life support system training and the other part of their job as firefighters who did not perform or weren't licensed for advanced life support system duties. So under the Fair Labor Standards Act, court noted that such training hours, certain kinds of training could be excluded from the computation of hours worked and time spent. And the apprentices here are claiming that those hours should have been included and they should have been paid, paid time and a half. And the court, you can see, is rejecting that argument. In fact, they characterized as non compensable time spent by employees as here of state and local governments in their required training. That attendance outside of regular working hours at specialized or follow-up training, which as here under state regulations required by law, for their certification as advanced life support system here, you know, of pi uh, public and private sector employees, those hours may indeed be unpaid, as here, where they're seeking the apprentice's certification of public and private emergency rescue work. So as a result, the court concluded the EMT emergency medical technician training here necessary to maintain certification need not be counted as hours worked if training takes place during non-working hours. The court noted that time spent in organized program of related supplemental instruction as here by employees working under a bona fide apprenticeship program may be excluded from working time. Because applying the criteria from Walling under the facts of this case, as the court will see fine, such time does not involve productive work or the performance of the apprentice's regular duties. It's more for the benefit of the trainee as opposed to work for the employer. So this related instruction that they were gaining experience to get additional certifications, be certified in an advanced life support system, would not be counted as hours worked. Plaintiffs here claim the required clinical time training should have been compensable because it, they claimed it was productive work and constituted performance of their regular duties. It was a variation on a theme of their day job, if you will, as firefighters. Court, federal district court here, rejected this argument. They noted that when they were gaining this practical experience required by the state regulations, that a regular medic unit would usually be staffed by two individuals, and that the trainee would be assigned to a medic unit, gaining the necessary experience for the advanced life support certification, they would be assigned as part of their training. They would be a third person because there would always be two staff provided. 
So since the trainee would then be a third person on a team, they certainly weren't displacing regular employees or performing their duties. That they were there to pick up the experience and in fact, the third wheel, if you will, may indeed slow them up in helping the trainee along. So as a result, under these circumstances, court concluded plaintiffs had not established any benefit the city may have received from the trainees present is anything more than de minimis. Yeah, this extra person may have been helpful, but they could also, particularly at the, without experience, be getting in the way of the more experienced people who would have to supervise them and, and help them along um, as effectively student interns gaining practical experience beyond their day job as firefighters for this advanced life support training certification that they were seeking and spending additional hours in so doing and they claimed they should have been paid for it and to be not be paid violated the Fair Labor Standards Act and see applying the six criteria out of Walling, federal court rejected that argument. In fact, any benefit to the city was far outweighed by the benefit to the trainee. And if indeed the focus, the benefit all accrues to the trainee, then that would qualify under the Fair Labor Standards Act that it could be an unpaid internship. That they were completing a required component of their certified rescue technician training. So as a result, the court granted the city's motion for summary judgment, effectively dismissing the case brought by the apprentices under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the practical implications here, rather than confront the Department of Labor in a enforcement action, if you have questions and there's no litigation already pending, certainly you may seek advice for a particular situation and it would come in the form of a wage and hour division, Department of Labor opinion letter, as we've seen. And certainly in any legal issue, um, this information gives you an idea of the issues and questions, issues in recreation administration, but one should always seek legal advice from local counsel um, before proceeding. That being said, assuming an unpaid internship is closely supervised, part of an academic program, once again the presumption is that such internships are exempt. That's the position of the Department of Labor, assuming, once again, they satisfy the six criteria in the Wowing versus Portland Terminal Company case. Once again, to reiterate, if it incorporates the following characteristics that are suggested in those six criteria, that it's a real life situation and if the objective is to provide interns with an educational experience which is related to their course of study and unavailable in the classroom. So in the context of a vocational school as we've seen, that type of teacher-student environment. Further, the employer derives no immediate advantage and may be in fact disadvantaged by supervising interns in their activities. And finally, interns' ac activities will not displace regular workers. So that completes our review of this particular article uh, illustrating a legal issue in a recreation administration uh, whether indeed unpaid student internships uh, violate 
or in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Hopefully this gives you a better idea uh, of the concerns many educators had that were prompted by that article that appeared uh, in the New York Times that we started at the outside of this presentation. So that concludes our review and we'll see you next time. I'm Professor Kozlowski.